Hello, and welcome to a very special series I am moderating on diversity, equity, and inclusivity by CME Outfitters. This CMEO briefcase is entitled Racial and Ethnic Disparities in Mental Health Care, Real World Strategies to Address Inequities in Treatment and Outcomes. This program is supported by an educational grant from Johnson & Johnson. My name is Dr. Monica Peek, and I'm the Ellen H. Block Professor of Health Justice in the Department of Medicine at the University of Chicago where I also am the Associate Director for the Chicago Center of Diabetes Translation Research and the Director of Research and an Associate Director at the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics. Uh, my main clinical job is to be a primary care physician. And in that role, I see a lot of patients with depression and other sort of basic um, psychiatric illnesses. And part of that reason is that there are many people in primary care who feel stigmatized um, and aren't yet ready to seek mental health services. And many of my patients, um, actually uh, what I, one of the patients I saw recently um, who I was trying to encourage to see a therapist said that she sometimes feels like her therapists or providers feel like they're up here and she's down here or that they don't really understand what she's going through. And she has a hard time talking to other people. And I said, but I was holding both her hands. And I said, but, but you talk to me. And she said, but Dr. Peek, you feel my pain. I can see it in your eyes. And so one of the things that I hope that we get from this session is to have the ability for all of us to help connect better with our patients so that um, we can all do a better job of providing um, the kind of care that our patients need who have depression, who are coming from marginalized populations, um, not just in primary care, but all of us. Um, so I'm really excited to be joined today by my distinguished colleague, uh, Dr. Rakesh Jain. Dr. Jain, would you mind introducing yourself? I'll be happy to Dr. Peek, but I must first say your introduction of what you do and why you care about this issue was brilliant. You are completely right. Primary care is where American mental health challenges live. And the first line of defense is indeed the primary care and our patients who have a variety of uh, challenges, could be racial, could be economic, are really, really harmed. So I too am looking forward to this conversation. In terms of who I am, I'm a colleague of yours. I am currently a psychiatrist, but I in fact trained in primary care and oncology before wow. I came to psychiatry. I am the clinical professor of psychiatry at Texas Tech University School of Medicine, and I'm an adult, child, and adolescent psychiatrist. Very much looking forward to our conversation. Very excited. Um... What a wonderful background that you have, just all of these different kinds of specialties and skills all rolled up into one that I imagine really make you just an outstanding uh, healthcare provider. Um, before we begin, I do want to note that this program was designed to build upon some foundational concepts that we've covered in previous DEI activities. Activities. And so to learn more about the impact of systemic racism on healthcare and health disparities, um, as well as just present um, disparities in the mental health field, we encourage you really to look at some of these foundational programs, which you can see here um, in our links. Now, before we begin, I also want to point out that Rakesh and I have decided to refer to each other by our first names for this session because we're colleagues and we just feel comfortable that way. So Rakesh, I really just feel um, excited about our conversation today, and I really hope that our audience gains a lot from it because I'm really looking forward to it. Um, our first learning objective for the day is to learn how to implement strategies to address inequities in the treatment and outcomes of patients with major depressive disorder, something that is so very common in all of our practices. So to open up our discussion, I think it's important to first think about disparities in the diagnosis of depression. Um, and as I had mentioned earlier, sort of started us out with um, a personal story about some of the, about one of my patients that I saw recently um, and uh, just how common that experience is. There's so many of my patients that I was actually talking to my kids uh, about how frequently I see patients. I'm not sure why they asked me that. Um, but I said, sometimes I'll see patients, you know, in general, every three to four months, but if they're going through something traumatic in life, um, or if they have depression and they're not yet ready to see a provider, I might see them every month 
you know, until that major crisis is over or until, you know, they're ready and they're stable and able to be seen less frequently. And so um, that's part of sort of what I do as a primary care provider. Um, and so, Rajesh, can you talk about some of the disparities that we see in the diagnosis of major uh, depressive disorder for the, for our audience and help sort of set the context for our discussion today? Sure, Monica, I'd be happy to. So you nailed it. There is uh, two major forces opposing each other that are to be found in contemporary American society. Force number one is the incidence and prevalence of major depression is rising in every community. Every single community, there is a challenge. It's in young, it's in old, it's in rich, it's in poor, it's in white, brown, black, it's in everybody. It's in urban populations, it's in suburban populations, it's in rural populations. But having said that, as I'm showing you here on this slide, there are specific challenges that apply to those individuals who are in America's racial and ethnic minorities. So for example, we have, the data clearly points out, not just a equally high prevalence rate of depression in such populations, but we have a dramatically lower rate of either self-identification or very worrisomely, Monica, identification by specialists. Hmm. It's almost as if a brown or a black body walks into an office and that body and that person has depression. They are both less likely to report it, mm -hmm. but the clinician is much less likely to detect it. Mm -hmm. The other challenge is, is even if it's detected, the rates of being offered appropriate treatments, be it psychotherapy or be it pharmacotherapy is lower. There is some kind of barrier we have when we meet individuals of racial and ethnic minorities that we simply, despite not making the diagnosis very often, when we do make the diagnosis, we simply don't take the steps the right steps in ways that we would with the white population. What is that barrier? We will have to talk about that. And then of course, even in these populations, Monica, there are sub-segments of people who are even in more trouble. And those might be the LGBTQ plus community and they are really challenged. So to be black and to be transgender and perhaps to also be poor, adds layer upon layer of challenges. So I did not enjoy presenting this slide to you, but it's a necessary slide. It points out that we in America really are challenged at multiple levels and solutions to this problem may only come about if we talk as broadly as we are today. Yes, and you know, for some reason, it is only now occurring to me as you say those words that part of the issue, unlike other pro uh, medical problems where people would present with chest pain or, you know, diabetes, the symptoms of depression and the ability to communicate those can easily be misinterpreted by clinicians as they're communicating with patients. They may be seen as an, a difficult or angry patient, or they may you know think they're having just uh, a difficult time communicating with them or just other things that make it challenging um, otherwise because of cultural discordance, racial discordance, and other things that are sort of non-verbally occurring in that encounter that make it less likely that they're gonna actually be diagnosed um, appropriately. Um, so thank you for just helping just right now open my eyes. And I'm somebody who thinks about this all the time. Um, so let's dive into a patient case and see if we can sort of see this uh, through the lens of a clinical practice. Um, so would you mind presenting the case of Luna um, and their pronouns to the audience? I'd be happy to, Monica. So this is Luna. This person's pronouns are they, them. An 18-year-old non-binary Latinx individual, first-generation American, followed up it's very interesting. This is probably a patient you just saw maybe this last week, following up with primary care after presenting earlier to the emergency room because of suicidal ideations. But as is classic for American healthcare, ERs aren't simply designed to help such individuals. And because they assessed, 
this individual didn't have an active plan. They discharged and said, just go to primary care. Okay. If you look at the vital signs, um, if you look at uh, blood pressure, height, weight, the BMI, there's something to be noted here. The BMI is on the higher end, but what's really to be noted is the PHQ-9, which by now is a pretty much a standard instrument in your and my specialty. Absolutely. And a 21 gets my attention. Absolutely Absolute. gets my attention. Yes, yes. And we'll talk more about uh, the PHQ-9 of 21. But this clinician, this primary care clinician was very astute, did a very nice job making sure that the diagnosis of bipolar disorder was excluded, not just by using the MDQ, but also through a clinical interview. So that's pretty much what we have with this patient. Excellent. Um, so we talked about some of the disparities in the diagnosis of depression, but we also know that there are disparities in treatment. So what can you tell us about that? Yes, I think you are one more time elucidating the facts very accurately. It's not that we have a problem. We have a chain of problems. And that chain in many ways starts in society, particularly societies of color, where recognition of depression or acceptance of depression is at a lower rate than perhaps the white population. I'm Asian and in my culture, it's almost better to have cancer than to admit that you've got depression because depression is so often seen as a cause of moral deficits. Yes. So. And amongst Blacks, very often that's an issue. Amongst uh, Latina communities, that's an issue. And of course, amongst Asian, these are the three big clusters, if you will, of minorities. But this is found in every racial and ethnic minority. But the big challenge beyond that is this patient's exemplification that even though this individual showed up in the ER, did not get the right diagnosis. Now, if you walked in with an abdominal pain and you had appendicitis, the ER clinician would have said, I got the diagnosis, I feel competent, mm -hmm. but not with depression. They just yeah. got referred. Yes. And no treatment, really, no treatment. If a person walks in with suicidality, it's not just a good idea to say, go see your primary care, do something about it. So here in this slide, I really wanna highlight what you started discussing, which is there are real disparities in the treatment of major depression in America. And I've got five panels that I think articulate the facts on the ground. Number one, treatment rates are shockingly low with both psychotherapy as well as pharmacotherapy. Number two, the challenges may be partly clinician, but it may also be the patient the patient may not be willing to accept the diagnosis for a variety of reasons. It is unusually important that we recognize that the patient who may actually have insurance may also be vulnerable to getting under treatment. For example, we have data that shows Medicaid patients in nearly every state in the union, even though their rates of depression are strikingly high, simply don't even get a diagnosis or a prescription for an appropriate medication. And by the way, let's not ignore the plight of the young. The younger you are, the more ethnically diverse you are, more racially diverse you are, more gender diverse you are, or yes. sexual preference diverse you are. Interestingly, every single, every single thing I've articulated increases the risk of depression, but decreases the risk of them getting appropriate treatment. So Monica, in summary, all I can tell you is this is just a tough issue. I'm not able to offer you any silver lining here. We're not doing well as a community by such patients. And there's real reason to change our thinking so that we can help them. You know, one of the things I do in my practice is try and help change patients' paradigm of how they think about medicine treatment for depression. You know, and I tell them, you know, your brain is an organ just like your pancreas. You know, if you have diabetes, you don't tell your pancreas to, you know, think better and do better and make more, you know, insulin, you would, you know, treat it with medication. But the problem is that our brain is also our mind. And so our mind is telling us that we don't need treatment because we can, you know, think better and do better. But our brain 
is regulated by hormones, just like every other organ. And so if our brain needs, you know, some extra help and support getting better, why wouldn't we treat that like we would every other medical problem? And so I tried to help them, you know, almost medicalize it in a way that they can sort of then take some of the stigma and the sort of personal blame and say, well, this is a medical problem. And I have, you know, I'm willing to treat my hypertension and I'm willing to treat this. This is a, you know, uh, this is a medical issue. This isn't a personal failure. Um, And so let's, let's address it as such and think about it in that way. That's great. That is a masterclass in how one should communicate with patients, which is to meet them where they are. Mm -hmm. And the model that you just recommended, which is straight from motivational interviewing, very well done, is to use examples that resonate with an individual and decrease their defenses and increase their acceptance of the disease model and the treatment model. And I want to show you with Luna, for example, that was a necessity. So when Luna presented, Luna is presenting with classic symptoms of depression and insomnia and restlessness and anxiety and suicidality. It's full spectrum, but still doesn't know what's wrong with them. Now, if you ask them what's not going well in your life, they, they would say, I lost my mother to COVID. I live with my grandmother. I have cousins who have been challenged. I have to rely on others for transportation. This is an individual who's going to need a lot from us. Not only is this person from a background that's challenging, but this individual also has other variables like transportation and education. Uh, The home is Spanish speaking, which could then mean if you're trying to send printed information in English for education, it's not going to work. Right. So those are things that we have to think about. Uh, denial of mental illness is very common in many populations. But if you ask them, not questions like, is there anybody who has depression in your family? But if you ask them things like, is there anybody in your family who just stayed tired a lot, in bed a lot, or sat a lot, cried a lot? They go, oh, you're talking about half my family members. Right. Now, they don't identify as depression but they have it. And by the way, in Luna's family, there is no history of interacting with the medical system for the care of major depression. So there are some challenges and the approach you recommended, which is to take a medicalization approach, really can help a patient and the clinician use a shared decision-making model. And by the way, that's exactly what happened with Luna. And uh, this individual agreed to taking an antidepressant therapy and agreed to a safety plan. Excellent. Um, I I really like that uh, this case sort of highlights some of the structural barriers, the sociocultural barriers, um, and then what the physician and Luna can do together to get her to a place of safety, of emotional safety um, and in treatment. Um, so, uh, you know, and all the sort of variables, the social, um, the the personal risks and and the, and the social risks. So we talked a bit already about some of the social drivers of health when thinking about patients with major depressive disorder. And so what I want you to, um, do is sort of help the audience think about what's most important to consider when it comes to social determinants of health is regarding both the positive and the negative social drivers and how they might impact disease for patients because some things um, can be harmful, but some social drivers are positive. And how, what um, what are things that um, can support patients? What are things that can positively impact their disease course that we might want to sort of lift up and highlight? Yeah, let's, let's appreciate that every human being comes with strengths and weaknesses, not just weaknesses, but strengths and weaknesses. I very much like the approach you've taken, which is why just look at the weaknesses of a person's system, but also look at the strengths. For example, this particular individual we just met, Luna. Well, Luna may have a very strikingly supportive social network. It's quite possible that this individual is in a community of other um, gender um, 
non-conforming individuals. Maybe they have a very tight network of individuals they've connected on Facebook or in a live group. I need to find out. I need to not just look at Luna and say, hmm, a Latin person, hmm, very young. Oh my gosh, their family members don't speak English. It's going to be challenging. Oh my gosh, they even have some gender issues that I don't fully understand. And I don't even want to touch their issues about sexual preference. I could do all of that. Or what I could do it is lean into it with curiosity. Yes. Tell me, Luna, what's not going well in your life? What's, what's challenging? Transportation, I got it. But let me also hear what's going well in your life. Oh, you're bilingual. Okay. Oh, you got five or six friends who are close to you. Or you do have an aunt who may not speak English, but has consistently told you something is wrong and I want to help you with it. I think that's what we're talking about. <laughs> it is difficult to walk into a clinical encounter, Monica, with a preconceived notion that this individual will have five strengths and five weaknesses. The only way to find out is to have a broad framework that mm -hmm. every individual, you, me, and everybody listening to us has strengths and weaknesses in our systems. Yes. All of us have the ability, if just promoted by a healthcare provider, to further magnify our strengths. They just have to identify. So here on this beautiful slide, I'm showing you that adverse health outcomes really do flow from a combination of positive, negative. Everything that I've shared on this slide in the blue in an individual can be a strength or a positive. The key message, perhaps if I can leave the audience with is, the following. Don't walk in with preconceived notions. It's better to have a stance of respectful, open curiosity, yes. and then honest determination of strengths and weaknesses. The goal, of course, being to minimize the weaknesses and expanding on the strengths. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the thing that I would also just add is that um, even if there is discordance with your social identity and that of your patient, leaning into that space, like you said, with open curiosity and wanting to help is um, something that your patients will appreciate. Um, so I have a patient who is a black transgender male patient um, who also mm -hmm. suffers from depression. And so uh, I saw him several weeks ago. And I said, one of the things uh, that you need to do in addition to seeing his provider is find a social support group that is just like you. So we had a support group, but he's like, you know, none of my friends are exactly like me. I may have some transgender friends, but they're not black or they're not trans. And I said, find your unicorns, find a group of them. You know, you may have to go online. You may have to start one yourself. And so uh, when I saw him in clinic the next time, he's like, I found them. <laughs> I found them. <laughs> and we're meeting tomorrow. And they've got all these different things and, you know, things online. And he was showing me on his phone. They have, you know, games and, and whatever. And so I was so excited. You know, we're here in Chicago where, you know, there's just so many different communities. And so, you know, I don't know about these various communities, but I know that there was something for him that he could lean into. Um, and so in addition to the other kinds of structured support, I was able to sort of, you know, help him on his journey, uh, find other kinds of support structures for him. Um, so beautiful. Don't, <laughs> don't be afraid um, because that's what our patients are going to need from us is to not fear the unknown, but to walk with them um, on their journey. Um, so thank you so much already. Um, we're ready to move to our next learning objective, um, which is uh, to implement strategies to address inequities in the treatment and outcomes of patients on the treatment of resistant depression. And so this is usually where I make sure I hand my patients off to the trained professionals when they have resistant depression. So Rakesh, would you mind presenting our next case of Aurelia, um, pronouns she and her, uh, to our audience? Yeah, and so glad we're going to talk not just about major depression, but major depression that's really difficult to treat and that's actually common. 40 to 50% of people don't respond to two antidepressants for their current episode of depression. They need treatment as well. 
So here she is, Miss Aurelia, and she's a 65-year-old Black Jamaican patient. She immigrated recently from Jamaica and following up with her healthcare provider after referral from her primary care, like you would have done, and I think that's totally appropriate because the depression is simply not lifting. A uh, little bit of hypertension is quite evident. Her BMI also is 29. That needs to be kept in mind. PHQ-9, despite being on antidepressants multiple times, is still at a stubborn 16. And 16 worries me because anything that's 15 or higher, uh, the patient's not just depressed. The patient is depressed and in trouble. Again, the MDQ, which alerts me that this clinician wanted to make sure this wasn't bipolar, was in fact excluded. And it's really important we have a working definition of treatment-resistant depression. And this definition is widely accepted in my community and your community. And IMH, as well as APA, endorse it. And so does the National Institute of Mental Health. That is at least two antidepressants from any class. It doesn't have to be from different classes. Any class, if a person's tried two antidepressants at adequate dose, adequate duration, and they still are experiencing depression, that is treatment-resistant depression. And health disparities in TRD are huge. Yes. So can you talk a little bit about uh, these disparities in DRD? Yeah. You know, just a few minutes ago, you and I had a very lovely conversation about disparities in major depression. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid the disparities in TRD are further augmented. So mm -hmm. not only are Black and Latina and Asian patients, particularly if they're poor, particularly if they have had other structural challenges, not only are they not being offered antidepressants as often as they should be, they really get offered far less if they fail to antidepressants. It's almost as if clinicians make the erroneous assumption if they're not responding to antidepressants, they must be doing something wrong, that they don't want to change. And that is an error that we'll have to work on fixing. But I also have to admit, very many patients from the backgrounds I just articulated sometimes do assume if two treatments have failed, there's nothing else the profession has to offer. So here I'm showing you data that shows that MDD 30% of people have TRD. And sadly, the moment a health disparity of any kind steps in, the frequency of treatment receiving goes down. Mm -hmm. that, that's why Irelia is actually, thank God, a strong exception. She is saying, I'm not better. Please help me with yes. it. Yes. All right. Well, let's check back in with our patient, Irelia. Yeah, let's do that. And her symptoms are worth noting. She continues to be in depressed mood state and her anhedonia is a challenge. Weight is actually, if anything, has become more of an issue. She has the disorder that you specialize in, which, which is type 2 diabetes. Now look at her medication. She has, in fact, tried acetalopram, which is a very standard medication, mm -hmm. and not just at doses that are appropriate, but really appropriate doses for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. She's tried desvanlafaxine, which is an SNRI. Mm -hmm. Even that didn't work. She's concerned not just about her body, not just about her mind. She's actually concerned about her mind and body. And I think these disparities that we are really focused on discussing today, I think we should appreciate that TRD it is a disorder that extracts a great deal of price from the human being but I think it extracts, based on data, a higher burden in terms of family disruption, occupational function, if yes. the person is someone who falls in a health disparity situation. You, you've seen that, I'm certain, in your clinical practice. And for some good reason, or some for some bad reason, patients who are black or brown often only get medications prescribed by the healthcare providers. I don't think it's intentional, but it is a problem that we don't often offer them holistic care, such as exercise and nutrition, almost kind of making an erroneous assumption that they're not going to listen to us or somehow that will come across as insulting. And that's not appropriate. 
And these patients deserve high quality interventions for treatment refractory depression as much as everybody else. So they should be very good candidates if need be for ECT treatment or second generation atypical augmentation treatment or S-ketamine, which the FDA approved relatively recently in the last four or five years for the treatment of a TRD or any other treatment options that would be appropriate for others. But the bad yes. news I want to share with you, Monica, is such patients are simply not getting offered these treatments as often as they should be. Now, um, are there <clears throat> any insurance disparities for some of the newer medications? Yes. Think? Yes. I'm so glad you said that. There are disparities at every level I can see. Part of it is the health-seeking behaviors are often suboptimal. And that could be because of personal beliefs. It could be church or religious institution beliefs. It could be societal beliefs. But then when they come to our clinic, there are very many treatment options that are blocked. But I do have good news for you. In the treatment of major depression, and I'll use Texas as an example, mm. <laughs> if the clinician like Monica or like Rakesh identifies the patient correctly and makes appropriate documentation, assuming they do have insurance, be it governmental or private pay, the access is actually not as big an issue as we clinicians sometimes believe. Now, that's there's so no good. doubt, I'll use Texas as an example, Monica, because that's where I live. We have the nation's largest population of uninsured people. And yes. unfortunately, they tend to be Latina yes. or Black, much mm -hmm. more so than, than their white patients. Mm -hmm. So that is a barrier. But I also want to hasten to add the following. Sometimes the barriers aren't as large as we think from an insurance perspective when it comes to major depression, TRD. That's great to hear. And especially in Texas, because when I, no offense, but when I think of Texas, yeah. I usually think all things horrible. So <laughs> I don't blame you. I don't blame you. That is, but I will tell you, and, and having lived here in Texas for 37 years, we actually have a very progressive legislature when it comes to the treatment of mental health disorders, because such individuals not only suffer a lot, they mm -hmm cost the state a lot of money. Yeah. So perhaps this is a point that's worthy of underlying. The major barrier to brown and black, poor and rich, whoever, the major barrier does not appear to be insurance issues when it comes to treatment resistant depression. It appears to be clinician factors. Wow. We don't push along the cause of the patient as much as is appropriate. And look, look at the slide. Look at the drug augmentation for TRD options. It's a very broad list. Yes. Many of them are approved treatments. Some of them are off-label treatments. It isn't that we don't have choices, Monica. We have a lot of them. The problem appears to be we tend not to execute upon these options as often as we should in such individuals as we do in white patients. We need to fix that, don't you think? Absolutely, absolutely. Especially when we know that there are no financial issues. Let's go back to our case. Yes, why don't we do that? So let's remind individuals that her diagnosis appropriately wasn't just major depression, was treatment resistant major depression. She, by the way, is doing all that a person should do. She yes. is seeking other psychosocial approaches. In fact, she's even seeking spiritual help. Good mm -hmm. for her. I cannot mm -hmm. tell you how much I appreciate her doing that, right? Right. She's right. also, she's, she's the dream patient in many ways. She wants to be part of the conversation mm -hmm. in making a decision. I just love that. But I think that happened because her clinician, probably somebody like you, help her understand she is not just an equal member of the treatment team. She's the leader of the treatment team. And I think to feel that empowered is good for her. And in her case, the clinician did choose to try a third antidepressant, which is uh, maybe not a bad idea, maybe not a great idea, but 
it is something that if the clinician has chosen to do, hopefully they will educate about the most common side effects and also educate that if this treatment doesn't work, not to give up. We actually, mm -hmm. in fact, have multiple treatment options for treatment-resistant depression. And so you had mentioned that there are neurobiological alterations in treatment-resistant depression that might influence treatment selection. And then there may be harm that happens if we spend too much time sort of spinning our wheels with medications that may not be effective. Can you talk a little bit more about that? And I will pick up on the metaphor you use, spinning of the wheel, and show you a spinning wheel here. And the spinning <laughs> wheel here shows that all patients with depression, but particularly those who are challenged by social determinants of health, which is all of the things that we talked about, perhaps are more vulnerable to damage in their brain and their body with untreated depression. So for example, if the patient does not achieve remission, the HPA axis abnormalities are significant. Mm -hmm. uh, in the brain, we now have evidence that ongoing depression causes synaptic and neuronal plasticity changes that are not positive for the patient. Epigenetic mechanisms come into play that lead to a whole host of problems. The immune system may actually be impacted. So for every reason I can possibly think of, every human being, every body that walks into our practices, if they have depression, and especially if they have treatment-resistant depression, it is so important to move them along the pathway of treatment. That is so fascinating. I was not aware of that. But what I do know is that the mechanisms through which racism impacts health are the very ones you just mentioned. The HPA axis, the immune system, the cortisol, the, you know, all of the, the it's, it's fascinating and horrific um, that there's this synergy um, between the structural inequities that impact health and how depression which can be, you know, triggered by structural inequities, also sort of reifies those same, you know, pathways to harm your health and to make it more difficult to overcome your depression. I will never forget that. Um, so before closing today, let's check in with Aurelia one more time uh, to consider how to optimize her treatment plan. Sure. So Aurelia continues to be a solid partner. And the clinician appears to be a solid partner with her. So she did change the medication. Remember, we talked about that. She went to Vortioxine. Sadly for her, that antidepressant was still not effective. The poor lady is still suffering considerably. And her system around her is suffering. That, that's a real challenge. So now it's time to, as a clinician, to start thinking outside the monoamine world. Mm -hmm. And in her case, the clinician started thinking, okay, I've already tried mono means she's already overweight. I can't use a treatment that further adds to her burden. She already has type two diabetes. I don't want to choose perhaps a treatment option that could worsen those things. That, that's kind of a given. You never want to worsen things if possible. So in her particular case, the clinician and she start initiating a conversation on a glutamate-based NMDA treatment option. And I think that data shows that, that that is a very wise move for them to consider. Excellent. Thank you so much. I have learned so much from this program today. Um, I think the thing that was most important for me I'm going to say two things. <laughs> I can't. I can't limit it to one. Was understanding um, the two strikes you're out um, and the new classes of drugs, and then that spinning wheel and how it's just sort of grinding people through the same mm -hmm. pathways that racism works um, or structural inequities work for the same population. Um, what are the sort of, even though you, you were the one who gave, <laughs> gave this lecture, but what do you think are for you some of the things that were most uh, meaningful about our conversation today um, that you would want to share with the audience? 
I think knowing that you and I are brothers and sisters in this war together, mm. that you live in the northern part of the country, I live in the southern part of the country, you perhaps live in a blue state, I live in a red state. But the truth is, when it comes to major depression, everybody's heart bleeds purple. Oh, We're yes. in this together. Absolutely. We're in this together. We do need to keep in mind that some people are less fortunate than others. And it does appear without a shadow of a doubt based on data that our fellow human beings in America who are perhaps racial minorities, ethnic minorities, or are not conforming to the typical cultural expectations regarding gender or sexual orientation are at even greater challenge. We can solve every challenge, this is true, but there are so many challenges, Monica, that you and I as clinicians in the confines of our offices can make a difference. And the first thing is start by changing our minds and by changing our hearts. And I think our conversation today accomplished both. Absolutely. What a joy, what a joy, what an excellent conversation. I hope our audience feels the same. Thank you so much for sharing the data that you presented today, your clinical insights, your warmth in your heart. Um, I'm going to try and summarize our discussion hmm, <laughs> with our SMART goals. And those are goals that are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. So that's what I hope our audience will take away from this presentation and kind of try and apply to your own practice. First, to try and identify disparities in the diagnosis and the treatment of major depressive disorder. Second, to um, integrate holistic treatment strategies in the care of patients with major depressive disorder to address inequities and improve treatment outcomes. Third, to identify disparities in the diagnosis and treatment of treatment-resistant depression. And last, to integrate holistic treatment strategies into the care of patients with treatment-resistant depression to address inequities and improve treatment outcomes. This CMEO briefcase is one of a four-part CME CE initiative, and we hope that you'll take advantage and participate in all of the activities of the series. These activities cover strategies to address racial and ethnic disparities across a number of therapeutic areas. And I really encourage you all to join us for the entire initiative. It's really great. By participating in these activities, you demonstrate your commitment to improving health equity for all of your patients. The CMEO DNI Hub also has a number of very valuable resources available to you to help further your own education in diversity, equity, and inclusivity. So last, again, thank you so much, Rakesh. I want to thank you so much for joining me in such an important conversation. Uh, for our audience members to receive credit for this activity today, please complete the post-test and evaluation. We really want to learn from you because we take it to heart what you tell us. So your feedback, we um, try and incorporate changes. So we want to know what you liked, uh, how we can improve, and what additional topics you'd like for us to address. So last, I just want to sincerely thank you, our audience, for your commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusivity education. Together, we all together can strive to provide the best and most equitable care to all of our patients, particularly those who are marginalized and underserved. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. Have a wonderful day.